uh, Easter and, and resurrection, and I wonder which of the, uh, the resurrection uh, accounts is, uh, is your favorite, uh, perhaps, whether it's the early morning, whether that's Peter and uh, John going and Peter going into the tomb, uh, Mary Magdalene getting confused and thinking that, that somebody was, uh, Jesus was the gardener. Uh, the road to Emmaus, the road to Emmaus is probably mine. There's just that little verse in the middle of it. And then beginning with the Old Testament, Jesus then explains to these people, people uh, everything uh, that happened and how it all pointed uh, to what he was uh, going to do. Imagine that as a, uh, as a sermon. Um, the disciples, uh, the appearance for the disciples, whatever accounts uh, it might be. And we've got this morning uh, the, the reinstatement of of Peter, um, but that's not really the focus of where I want to land today. Uh, but earlier this week, I was listening to Radio 2. I was driving uh, into work, and they had one of the Pause for Thoughts. I'm sure you've all picked up on uh, Pause for Thoughts on whichever radio uh, station you may uh, listen to. And there was author and broadcaster Cole Morton. And he spoke about his grandparents. Uh, his granddad, Bert, was he called a South London rogue. And uh, he, in his younger days, went to a Salvation Army event. He was welcomed, uh, welcomed by a lady, uh, and the event really transformed his life, not only in terms of accepting Jesus and becoming uh, a Christian, but the lady who welcomed him uh, became his wife and Cole Morton's grandmother, Violet. They went through war, uh, poverty, life was tough for them. In their later years, Violet became ill and spent much of the time sleeping in the front room downstairs because she couldn't go upstairs. One evening, they were, she was sort of settling down and, and Violet looked across to Bert and she said, love, you look so tired. Can you go upstairs? Go upstairs to sleep because Bert thought it was really important to stay down and sleep with Violet. And so he said, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll go upstairs and, and sleep. And as, as he was going up, uh, she shouted to him at, as he was going up the stairs, Bert, I'm sorry for all of the trouble that I've caused you. Bert turned and looked at her and said, there's nothing to be sorry for. I know uh, and I'm sorry for the trouble that I've caused you. A little while later that evening, uh, in the words of I think the Salvation Army, uh, she was promoted to glory. A lovely phrase. Uh, but she died, in Cole, Port, not Cole Morton's words, uh, knowing that she was loved and forgiven. There wasn't a dry eye in the car, and I suspect there were very few dry eyes in kitchens that particular morning. This resurrection narrative that we've had read to us this morning places love and forgiveness at its heart as Jesus forgives and reinstates Peter. And he uses such a vivid parallel to just days earlier. Jesus probes Peter three times to parallel the three denials of Peter, all of which took place on the beach around that charcoal, charcoal fire to bring to Peter's senses, mirror in his mind of the fire he stood around just a few nights earlier to keep warm in the temple courts at the time he was denying Jesus. In that moment on the beach, the power of the resurrection, the hope, the love, the grace and forgiveness is seen in this interaction. Because, and sometimes we forget this, the resurrection changes everything. It changes absolutely everything. And those of you that were here uh, last week, Ruth read a poem to us uh, where we all had to take part, where it said, uh, there's no more sighing, crying, or goodbying. Death is defeated. Jesus conquered death. And in this light, uh, the coffin is simply fantasy. Whereas life and life eternal is our reality. Jesus is Lord and is Lord of all. And if he's not, he's Lord of nothing at all. It's binary. It's, pick and, it's not pick and choose. He is Lord of all or he's Lord of nothing at all. Jesus' instruction to Peter was a familiar one. Follow 
me. And that would have taken Peter back to the early days of when he met Jesus, where Jesus was inviting this ragbag bunch of people to follow him. Leave your nets and follow me. And it's at this point in verse 20 that I want to spend a few moments on. At this point, Jesus and Peter were probably, probably walking or moving. We sort of get the sense that they're gathered around eating uh, fish on the beach. And then there's this conversation. Do you love me more than these? And you sort of wonder if Jesus and Peter was just sort of going off, you know, when you have a barbecue with friends, and you're just having a, having a chat with somebody, you're just sort of walking or ambling along, and there's that conversation going on. And then we get to verse 20. At this point, Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper. Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what's about him? We perhaps sometimes miss this interaction. We focus understandably on the reinstatement of, of Peter. Absolutely. We perhaps sometimes move on to the last verse in the gospel. Jesus did many other things as well, and I suppose if each of them were written down, even the whole world would not have enough room for the books that would need to be written. That's a great line in itself, isn't it? But there's this interaction in the middle. We have someone identified as a disciple whom Jesus loved, following them, following them behind, following behind James, sorry, Jesus and Peter, perhaps as they ambled along, and following them. The disciple that Jesus loved was, of course, the author of this gospel, namely John himself. And he uses this phrase a number of times to identify himself in the gospel, particularly towards the end of John's gospel. <clears throat> in John 13, we have the Last Supper. We read that he was reclining up against Jesus. And there's this discussion going on with the disciples. Who is it that is going to betray you? And at this point, we read in John 13 that, that he leant back against Jesus. You just have had this insight into this moment of intimacy. And for those of us that have held uh, babies, or, or I suppose my trick whenever I'm let loose with, with a baby, I sort of try and hold, and I try and put my hand underneath and just sort of tap back, just to get sort of a, a rhythmic heartbeat going. That's always my trick. I don't know whether it works. It's, it's what I would tend to do. But it's the idea of John reclining up, leaning up, against Jesus and having the heartbeat of Jesus just resting and listening. Then in John 19 verse 26 we read about the disciple that Jesus loved at the foot of the cross, the only disciple who was present at the time of crucifixion. And there's the interaction where Jesus asked John to take care of his mother. Then in John 20, we have the first Easter Sunday morning. Peter ran to the tomb with John after Mary Magdalene had returned, saying that Jesus' body had been moved, and we don't know where it's gone. Peter and John ran to the tomb. Peter went in and looked. Another resurrection story in John 21, where John identifies who Jesus is. The disciples were out fishing, and these were expert fishers, fishermen, remember. It was their profession, it was their job, they were catching nothing. Jesus calls out and says, put your nets just the other side of the boat. John, ah, it's Jesus. That's who it is. And then the disciple that Jesus loved, and that term again is used in the passage that we've just had this morning. The disciple that Jesus loved was following them along. John was there in the big moments. 
what do we have? We have the Last Supper, the moment of crucifixion, that first Easter Sunday morning in two or more resurrection appearances. It's likely he was in the room where Jesus appeared, in that locked room, and Jesus appeared, and they were fearful. He says, peace be with you. He offers the thing that was needed at that time. He was also almost certainly there when Jesus ascended, which we'll come on to uh, in a few weeks' time with Ascension Sunday. But how did John get to this point and give himself this, this name or this title? Now, John was the brother of James, and they had a typical brother-esque relationship. You might recall some of their interactions. They had a discussion with Jesus. When we get to glory, can one of us sit on the left and another sit on the right of you, on your throne? Elsewhere in Mark 9, they were involved in an argument about who or which of them was the greatest. And this was just moments after John had come down the hill after seeing the transfiguration of Jesus. Which of us will be the greatest? And this was the precursor, of course, to the line about the first being last and the last being first. That was an interesting noise, wasn't it? I'm used to crackle and pop. That was a... John's only referenced line, the only thing that he says which is outside of, of John's gospel is in Mark 9. And he says, teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we asked him to stop because he, because he was not one of us. The one line that we have of John, not in John's gospel, is where he's asked Jesus to tell somebody off a non-disciple for trying to do something that only the disciples should be doing. They are not part of us, so they shouldn't be doing it. This was the disciple whom Jesus loved. We get a sense from the Gospels that John was ambitious, intolerant, Zealous, extremist, explosive. John was cap capable of being, uh, behaving in a sectarian way, perhaps narrow-minded, bending, reckless, impetuous. He was volatile, brash, aggressive, passionate, zealous and per personally ambitious. He was the disciple that Jesus loved. John saw things very clearly. And as you go on into the New Testament, you see some of his other writing further in. But this, with him, things are very black and white, light and dark, light and death, the kingdom of God against the kingdom of evil. You are either of God or of the world. Binary. No shades of grey. He was the disciple that Jesus loved. The disciple that Jesus loved gives us a glimpse of this meaning, of a meaning of Easter. With Jesus being Lord of all, it means we are not defined by our history. What's gone before? The stuff we are not proud of, John brought and brought baggage to the party. A history of stuff, of error, of mistake. But something happened. But something happened. And that thing that happened is that John aged well. With the guidance of Jesus and the nurturing of the Holy Spirit, all of John's liabilities were turned into assets. He matured. His greatest weaknesses became his greatest strengths. He grew in Christ, and the Lord's strength was made perfect in his weakness. 
is self-named the disciple that Jesus loved. It's not an arrogant, I'm better than you claim, but rather an indication of his humility. All the history that he had was dealt with. And it was covered by the grace, forgiveness, and love offered by Christ. And it was a constant reminder to himself that despite all of the history, he remained the disciple that Jesus loved. So how are we aging? What name do we give ourselves? Would we feel confident in signing off our emails or letters as the disciple that Jesus loves? And if we don't, that's sort of tough because he chooses to love us anyway. That we are not defined by our history in Christ is somewhere where we are all alike. But there's something that distinguishes. John is following along behind Peter and Jesus as they're talking. He's just following along, recognizing the low entry, the low entry bar to discipleship. Follow me, just follow me is the call of Jesus. As Jesus and Peter are ambling along, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. John is following Jesus. John is doing what he has been asked to do. When Peter saw him, he turned, he said, Lord, what about him? What about him? Peter's being given an insight into the path that he will follow. An insight into what next? An insight into where Peter's life will take him. And Peter's intrigued. And he's almost saying, okay, so that's sort of the direction of travel for me. That's my route mapped out. But what about him? What about John? What about him, the one behind? Jesus' response? What does Jesus say in response to Peter, who asks, well, what about John? What about him behind? Jesus says, what is that to you? Mind your own business. Keep your nose out. Nothing to do with you. What is that to do with you? And it's also, I suppose, part of human nature, isn't it? To want to know about others. The high street grapevine is a master of that. But if we delve a little bit into the New Testament, we see that the Paths of Peter and John are very different. Peter becomes the shepherd, whereas John is very much the, the seer or the, sort of the prophetic space. Peter is the preacher, stands up and talks. John is the writer. Peter's end of life is, is martyrdom. John has a, a peaceful death in his old age. Peter is often the one on the platform, speaking to, to masses and having thousands of people accept Jesus for themselves. John exists behind the scenes, quietly uh, getting on. Uh, a policeman was uh, sitting his, his final, a prospective policeman was sitting his final uh, exam before he was given his uniform and let out to go on the beat. And he was given a, a problem-based scenario. What would you do in this situation? 
And so the, the, the scenario read, you are, you are walking along a busy high street, uh, then all of a sudden the speeding car spins around the corner, the driver loses control, goes into the front of a, of a, of a greengrocer's. Do you still get greengrocer's? The, the vegetables outside and the fruit outside the greengrocer's all spill out into the middle of the road, causing a big collision with other cars in the middle of the high street. An old lady who is walking her dog, the dog gets spooked, the old lady lets go, the dog spoons, spins off and all manner of chaos is going on. Question, what would you do? His answer, take off uniform and mingle with crowd. To mingle with the crowd, to hide behind the scenes was John's uh, modus operandi, the way he was, very different to Peter. Peter and John had very different paths to walk. And so when Jesus looks at, at Peter and says, well, what's that to you? He's making the point that as we model through this thing called life together, and we join others on the road of following Christ, we will see that callings, gifts, stinks, convictions of people will differ to ours. We might look across and ask, should I be like that? Or why can't I do that? Is that what I should be doing? And John's actions in this passage perhaps suggest to us that there may be the wrong questions to be asking. Rather than looking across and saying, oh, maybe I should be like that. Maybe I should be on the platform. Maybe I should be doing that type of writing. Maybe I should be doing that type of ministry, whatever that might be. John's actions and what John is doing is a reminder that those wrong questions are the wrong questions. And instead, we need to simply revert to the basics. Follow me. Follow me. We'll all have different paths, difficulties, ministries, high points, low points. But our role is not to look across at others and, and see if there's a comparison or see where we are or what they're doing that we're not or what we're not doing that they are. But it's to simply follow Jesus. We've probably all come across someone or something or some presentation which has promised something as the next big thing. Buy this. Eat this. Go here. Do that. Everything will be great. But the reality, I would suggest, is very different and much more straightforward. The beginning of Hebrews 2 starts with, we must pay most, let me start again, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. Our stability comes not from the next big thing but by understanding of an old message. The hope of Easter. Death is defeated. Jesus is Lord of all. Our history doesn't define who we are. And we are look to look to and to follow Jesus. The most reliable anchor that we have is not the most recent discovery, but the surefire truths that have held their ground against the winds of change. The disciple then that Jesus loved, which is also us, by the way, not relying on other people's anchors, 
but by recognizing that our anchor. Our life is not defined by our past. Our failures are not final and death is not final. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Let's follow him. May we pray. Father God, thank you for the glimpses that we have of Jesus' life in the New Testament. We have half a mind or half an eye on those, those words right at the end of John's Gospel, that even uh, the whole world would not have enough room for the books that would need to be written about other things that Jesus did. And thank you for the glimpse, for the taste, for the insights that we have of times where you spoke with hundreds of people post coming back to life. We thank you that you are Lord of all. We thank you that the past is gone. And we thank you that our entry bar or our entry point to counting ourselves as one of your followers is simply to follow Jesus. At work, at play, at home, at school, help us to be followers of Jesus. Amen. In a few moments' time, Ken will come up and...